lovely people, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you are new here. My name is Grace and while I usually make yoga videos, today I thought I would do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a roundup and sort of mini review of all of the books that I read in January 2021. So I really hope to keep this going throughout the whole year, although let's not kind of over promise things, I will see how things go. But I've really enjoyed getting back into reading and reading from lots of different genres, so I thought I would just share that with you. So if that sounds your type of thing, then maybe grab a brew because I expect this will be a bit of a long waffly video from me. If you're not interested in hearing what I have to say on all of the books, I'm going to leave um, timestamps down below so that you can just skip ahead to the ones that you are burning to know about. So I'm going to go in the order that I read these books and I'm going to kick off with Margaret Atwood's The Testaments, which is probably one of my favourite books that I read in January. So what is The Testaments about? The Testaments is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which I read in sixth form, which is quite a long time ago now, and my main motivator for wanting to read this was that I had just binged watched the HBO series, which is incredible. If you've not seen it and you're looking for a series, I would highly recommend it. So to give you a bit of context as to what these books are about, The Handmaid's Tale and The Testaments are set in and around the Republic of Gilead, which is a republic, a totalitarian state that has kind of sprung up after this big war, big kind of landscape changing event in what we know as modern day North America. And in Gilead, things are obviously a little bit strange and weird and wonderful. It is dystopian fiction. I take that back, they're definitely not wonderful. They are mainly just weird and very harrowing. The main problem that has kind of arose from this war and this big landscape change is that fertility has been massively impacted and people are struggling to reproduce. So in an effort to resolve this issue, the Gilead government decide to round up remaining fertile women, regardless of where they've come from within the area of Gilead, you know, before it was Gilead, and force them to become handmaids, which are women who are sent to various they're called commanders in the novel, elite of society, and it's actually forced to bear their children. So it's all very uncomfortable and jarring and feels horrible. And The Handmaid's Tale details the events um, and the life of one of those handmaids. Margaret Atwood does an amazing job of building dystopian worlds and societies and I think that's one of my main gripes and I know a lot of other people's main gripes with kind of dystopian or speculative fiction novels is that the world around the events isn't really developed which definitely doesn't happen in either The Handmaid's Tale or this book. The, the events of this book are going to pick up about 15 years after the events of the first novel and we see Gilead and the fall of Gilead, I'm not really giving too much away in saying that, through the lens of three different characters, one of whom is Aunt Lydia, who is a very big character in the first book and through the series, who I loved and was itching to know more about after I finished the series, which is probably one of the reasons that I love this book. So it's very suspenseful and fast paced and I just, I love it. I'm a bit of a Margaret Atwood stan, to be honest. I know that a lot of people didn't really rate this book because they thought it was kind of written as a reaction to the success of the series. I don't really mind that. I'm very happy to be taken along in the world and mind of Margaret Atwood. So I would really recommend both this and The Handmaid's Tale if that sounds your kind of thing. Don't go ahead and just read this on its own as it probably won't make much sense and I think it does well as a sequel. So. I really loved reading that and I'm glad that I kind of got back into reading with this book. The second book I read this month was Sally Rooney's Normal People. I am very very late on the bandwagon with this one. I'm sure most of you probably already know what this is about but just in case you don't, Normal People follows the lives of, um, I've forgotten their names. <laughs> 
it wasn't that long ago that I read it, Connell and Marianne. There you go. So it follows the lives of Connell and Marianne as they leave school, go through university, and they are kind of, their lives are entwined in this kind of push-pull of love and hate and their relationship and their friends and all the teething pains of that period of your life. I was talking to a friend of mine um, last week about the other book that Sally Rooney has written which is called Conversations with Friends. I don't believe my friend has read this book but she said the one thing she really loved about Sally Rooney's writing was how kind of normal and not cliche it was which is why I think this has had such amazing success is because the way that it's written it's not cheesy and it's quite difficult to do you know um, young teenage romantic fiction without being super cheesy it is a little bit cheesy like let's be honest it the genre lends itself to that kind of cheesiness but overall I thought it was really well done and I thought that she handled mental health issues in this quite well it's handled really well in the series as well this is another one um, where there is a an absolutely cracking series to go with it I'm sure you have seen it but if you've not definitely put it on your list it's amazing one thing I would definitely say if you've not seen the series and if you've not read the book read the book first because I seriously felt as though the book had been in some ways robbed of me because it feels like a screenplay for the series because the series is so accurate and so well done both are great both are in the scheme of things relatively light-hearted very kind of emotional um but not too heavy and not too deep and you don't have to kind of disentangle any meaning in it it is what it is very good well done that would usually otherwise be a boring story so i really enjoyed that the next book i read was a debut novel by richard osman who i actually didn't realize until halfway through the book is the guy off pointless stupidly the guy with the glasses off pointless wrote this and it's called the thursday murder club i loved this book um, if you are in the mood for a very light, easy, funny read, which I kind of think we all are at the minute, highly recommend this. It is, I mean, even the premise of the book from, for me is hilarious. It's set from, from the perspective of four pensioners who are living in a very luxurious retirement complex. And every Thursday evening, they meet up to discuss unsolved murders and they're getting these kind of leads and stories from one of their friends who unfortunately is in a pretty unresponsive state um, she's coming to the end of her life uh, that lady is a retired detective who's who's giving them all of this information or you know it's part of her belongings that is is being passed on to these these four people doing the thursday murder club and they're, they're eagerly trying to kind of crack all these mysteries for their friend and one day, the four of them become embroiled in a real-life murder investigation. I did find the first half of the novel considerably funnier than the second half, but in all, I loved it. I thought it was great as a debut novel for Richard Osman, and I know he is writing The Thursday Murder Club 2. Um, I, when I was reading this, I learned that the rights for it, I think, have been bought for a TV series. I could be completely wrong here, but I could see this working really well as a play. And I don't know why, not that that makes it any different. <laughs> it's very, um, the humour in it is very dry and very British and very silly. So it's very up my street in that it's just daft, which I like. Some of the reviews on it read, such a beacon of pleasure, which I would agree with. It was very, very just funny, easy to read, love it. So if you're on the hunt for something like that, this would be my top pick in that kind of category for this month. Loved it. Okay, the next novel I'm going to talk about does come with a little bit of a trigger warning. So if you are not comfortable knowing that, then feel free to just skip ahead to the next book. The book I'm talking about is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. This is another debut novel and I'm sad to say I didn't think it was as much of a success as Richard Osman's debut attempt. This novel details the life of Vanessa Y, who is the protagonist, 
and she recalls her relationship with an old English teacher called Professor, I think it's Professor or Mr Strain and the novel is kind of split between these two narratives of her living and working in 2017, many years after she's left school and then it kind of flashes back to, I think it's 1999, 2000, 2001 time when she was in school and when the abuse from her then English teacher had started to happen. The novel is kind of about coming to terms with the fact that Vanessa has been abused and I think to give it dues it did, you know, that, that was kind of the thread of the novel and that's what I felt like was happening. We were kind of allowed into the workings of Vanessa's mind and how she felt she was coming to terms with the fact that actually she had been in an abusive relationship. That being said, there are some things that I think were really, really clumsily done in this book and please don't think I am having, uh, this opinion is in any way a reflection of my opinion on those who, you know, are sharing their experiences of abuse or this isn't me commenting on how we should view survivors of abuse, this is me commenting on how this novel was written. It leans so heavily on Lolita that I found it really clouded my experience of reading the book. And I think readers of this novel are going to fall into two separate groups. I think there will be people who have read Nabokov's Lolita and people who haven't. And I think if you haven't read Lolita, you're probably more likely to, yes, be unsettled and disturbed by this novel because it is very unsettling in parts, but also be able to see it a little bit more for what I think Russell was trying to do and I think people who perhaps have read Lolita are going to think this is way too reliant on it. The first hundred pages or so I was just waiting for Lolita to come up. It, for me it was blindingly obvious that this was going to happen, not just because the subject matter is so close to the events of Lolita, it's because it feels it's part of the fabric of the book and for me that really confused things and it's something that is kind of you're beaten over the head with as the book progresses and I imagine if you've not read Lolita it's kind of a bit of a peripheral reference that doesn't hold much water or you kind of just you know google the synopsis and you think oh okay you know this is this is reference to a novel that um, is very similar thematically to this one and I understand why it's happened. I get why she was saying it, but I didn't feel it was well done, it was very kind of clumsy, it was very just kind of like, let's put Lolita in here because we have to because of the subject matter. And I didn't really understand if what Russell's trying to do is make a modern um, commentary on Lolita or whether she's just putting it in there for effect. I don't really understand. I didn't understand the purpose of Lolita in this novel and for me it just got in the way of everything else. I have seen quite a few reviews that, that, that say this book was too long and I also agree with that. I think she could have done away with the whole ramblings about Lolita, stuck to the very powerful main thread of the story and it would have been great. So unfortunately I wouldn't really recommend this novel. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't really rate this, I wouldn't recommend it. Let's move on. Now, in complete contrast to my dark Vanessa being too long, the next novel I think could have been double the length and it was The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. So the plot of this novel follows two twins, let me just check their, their surname, yeah, the Vignes, I'm probably absolutely butchering that name. I will read you a little bit of the blurb because while it's not a complicated plot, I think this will do a bit of a better job than what I can. After growing up together in a small southern black community and running away at age 16, it's not just the shape of their daily lives that is different as adults, it's everything, including their racial identities. Many years later, one sister lives with her black daughter in the same southern town she once tried to escape. Across the country, the other secretly passes for white, and while her husband knows nothing of her past, I'm sorry, her white husband knows nothing of her past, 
Still, although separated by so many miles and just as many lies, the fates of the twins remain intertwined. I really, really loved the way that Brit Bennett writes. The characters were very well developed and I would have just liked to see more of them. And for me, what I loved about this book the most was how well the themes were dealt with and how many of them were in there without it seeming overdone. So obviously you have the issues of colorism and racism. And I don't think I've ever read anything that deals with colorism so specifically. It deals with issues of gender and sexuality, issues of identity, racial identity, um, kind of trauma over time, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I really, really like this. I would definitely recommend it. It's not, I wouldn't classify it as like a light read, but I think it's very important and very kind of poignant and makes you think in a bit of a different way. So I think she did a really great job. I like it and I'm keen to read more by her. So that was The Vanishing Half. The next book I read falls into very much the same category as The Thursday Murder Club and it is Emma Gannon's Olive. I think I just picked this up because I liked, I liked the colour of the cover. To be honest with you which is you know we always say don't judge a book by its cover but here I am so Olive is about Olive the story's protagonist and her journey into and out of her early mid late 20s into her 30s she's surrounded by a group of friends and they are all trying to nav navigate the pitfalls and highs and lows of modern life especially for women. A really kind of trite, simplistic way of describing this book is to liken it to Sex and the City. I definitely got big Sex and the City vibes from it, but it's a little bit more grounded than Sex and the City. It's a lot more believable. I really liked all of the characters in it. I'm sure if you are in and around that age, you can probably see people in your own life represented in this novel. And the whole kind of nuts and bolts of it is that Olive does not want to have children and one thing that looking back on this book I actually think was done really well is I I feel we were all probably guilty of this I kind of was expecting this this bigger question of will Olive have kids to be answered in some kind of way it is answered in the book I'm not gonna spoil it too much but I think we're always trying to look for specific reasons as to why things happen and why things don't happen, or I am at least, I'm definitely that type of person. And I think that this book did a really nice job of kind of saying, you know, sometimes people are different and that's fine. It's very easy to read, it's very, it's very readable. Um, it's about 400, 400-ish pages. It's I think this is another debut novel. Yeah, it is. Emma Gannon is the host of the podcast Control Alt Delete, uh, which is where you might have heard her name before, and she's also a columnist. I thought it was definitely written in that style. I could feel her journalistic flair kind of coming through. It was all quite snappy and not ornate in how it was written. It definitely wasn't, it didn't feel to me like beautiful, eloquent prose. It was just a nice story. So yeah. Not too deep, but at the same time, it had quite um, meaningful, profound moments for me. So I liked it. And if that sounds your type of thing, you probably will too. So we're now getting on to the last few books. And these ones I really, really loved. Most of these anyway. The first one is The Wall by John Lanchester. This is right up my street. This is exactly the type of thing that I love to read. This is a speculative fiction novel set in the UK and it is after a huge event that is not really ex expanded upon in the novel that has resulted in a massive wall being erected around the entire coastline of the UK. The novel is set from the perspective of, I believe it's John Cavanna. I can't remember, he's only really referred to as Kavana in the book anyway, who is a guardian of the wall. So everyone in the UK at some point has to go and serve time on the wall. 
I think it's a good few years and it's described as an incredibly boring job. You're essentially preventing people getting in and out and the story follows the life of Kavana on the wall and then later off the wall. I'm not going to give too much away. I found the first part of the book really really dragged and it was only until after I'd finished it that I kind of realised oh this is why it dragged. It was to really highlight how flipping boring the wall is. I thought it was very well done for a speculative fiction. Same kind of vibe to you know Atwood's dystopia of Gilead but this is obviously rooted in a lot more realism. I could see this happening 100% which is what made it kind of quite alarming for me. Obviously you've got big themes of like Brexit and Trump's America in there with a wall and keeping people out. You've got issues of kind of immigration and immigration politics and EU things. Uh, they're not you know explicitly dealt with in the novel. This isn't a a contemporary history book they're all just themes that are kind of alluded to through characters and ideas in the book. In the first part of the book as well John Lanchester kind of plays with concrete poetry which I thought was very kind of didactic and I liked it I like that kind of stuff I get it if you don't but for me it was good if you want a well-paced engaging but not too heavy read that's full of action and definitely check out the wall. The next thing I read this month was Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye which is set in post-depression 1940s Ohio and it's all about a very poor black family. We've got Pauline, Cholly, Sam and Peckler and the novel kind of the first half of it deals mostly with Peckler's experience and how she really really wants blue eyes the same as those of her privileged white school fellows. On the blurb it says, at once an intimate and expansive, unsparing, truth-telling story, the bluest eye shows how the past savagely defines the present, which is a very good way of summarising some of the central themes of the novel. It's all about how the family's intergenerational trauma is passed down, how it affects the past and the present, and time is kind of a little bit choppy in the novel as well. We'll start with Pekela, and then almost work in reverse and find out a little bit more about her family and then that how then that gets passed on to her or those experiences do whether that's subconscious or conscious so definitely dealing with a lot of very heavy important issues obviously you've got racism overt and insidious poverty and general inequality how we identify the self and in relation to other people I found that Toni Morrison's writing is absolutely beautiful. I love the way that she writes. It's almost like prose poetry, but it feels very, very light. It doesn't feel like you're kind of wading through very ornate language. And I'm really excited to read more by her. Definitely not a kind of quick, easy, light read, but one that I feel like I definitely should have read earlier on and I'm pleased to say that I have now so if that sounds interesting I definitely give it a go. Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Oh my god it's been ages since I've read a book that is this good. I just finished the sequel to this which was definitely not as good as Annihilation but it set the bar so high that I would have been surprised if it did. Annihilation is about a mysterious area called area x which has been blocked off for many years and for many years expeditions soldiers have been sent into area x to investigate what happened as in what happened to create area x it is this place where we don't really know what happens in there it's all shrouded in a lot of mystery and drama and it's kind of almost supernatural but we don't really know we don't really like find out in the book and Annihilation follows the journey of the biologist who is the central character in Annihilation into Area X so she's part of the 12th expedition though if you've read the sequel you know there's a little bit of a caveat there and her experience inside Area X I could not get over 
the pace of this novel. I don't think I've ever read something that just kind of gallops through at this speed. I was constantly wanting to read more. It's eerie and creepy and I don't think I've ever read anything that is as chilling as this without it being an overt horror novel. So if you like action and suspense and maybe a little bit of kind of sci-fi mixed with dystopia then this is definitely for you. I can sort of say about the sequel as well, I would recommend you, you pursue the trilogy but this is probably going to be the best, I can already tell because it's amazing. I loved it. So the last book I read this month was Deborah Levy's The Man Who Saw Everything and this is about a guy called Saul Adler who is hit by a car on the Abbey Road uh, zebra crossing, the one that's made famous by the Beatles and he was on the zebra crossing because his girlfriend was taking a photo of him to replicate the Beatles um, famous photo so that he could take it to East Berlin where he is spending a little bit of time before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So obviously you've kind of got the context of communism and East Berlin and Germany and everything that happened in the Cold War that comes in to the novel and about halfway through the life of Saul in Berlin when he gets there is interrupted and we find ourselves I think it's set in 2017 I could be wrong maybe I'm making that up I don't know but we are all of a sudden back in kind of modern day and Saul has aged many years and is in hospital and then the narrative starts to become very very choppy and we are forwards and backwards in time. Saul is recalling the events pre-fall of the Berlin Wall and his experience of living in East Berlin and then we are brought right up to date in his life in the hospital and who his girlfriend is and it's all a little bit surreal to be honest. I didn't love this but I didn't hate it and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it either just because it didn't wow me and I think I came into it off the back of Annihilation so I was like buzzing off Annihilation and then Deborah Levy came in and was like no this is what I'm trying to do and I was like no I want more Annihilation so that's probably my own kind of bias against it coming in a little bit um, in terms of like reading experience I was just coming in off the back of an incredibly fast paced very linear novel and I got this which is a surrealist kind of very almost it feels quite dreamlike in parts but I think it's quite clever and maybe I need to reread it after having calmed down off my annihilation high so if this sounds of interest for you then definitely check it out. So thank you guys so much for watching this video if you have any thoughts or opinions on anything I've said or if you'd like to leave your own thoughts on any of the novels and books I've talked about then feel free to leave those in the comments section let's have a little little chat about the books like I said at the beginning I really hope to keep these going but let's not count our, our chickens before they've hatched <laughs> Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, whatever it is that you're doing, and I will see you next time. Bye!